Welcome to this workshop, It's Alive, a special Halloween soil building workshop presented by the Master Gardeners of Nevada County. Here are our workshop presenters, Kristen Otto, Peggy Slyker, and Mary Sanachis. Hi, I'm Kristen Otto, and I've been living in Nevada County for about 22 years. I became a Master Gardener here um, in 2009. And um, I'm a retired garden designer, uh, but my passion is growing food and growing healthy soil. And that's what we're going to be talking to you about on this Halloween uh, soil workshop. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope you learn a lot and help you learn how to grow great soil. Hello. My name is Mary Sanicus, and I am the Bride of Frankenstein. We're here to celebrate the most important holiday of all, Halloween. The holiday in honor of all the creatures underground, the creepy, the crawly, all the ones we will be talking about today. And these creatures are found in compost. Now, first we have other resources. We would like you to look at our compost workshop because it will give you underground background that you need. We have many resources, a video, a Zoom workshop, slides, and, uh, and all kinds of handouts. So please check out the Master Gardener website. And now I would like to introduce the mad professor. Hello. In the spirit of Halloween today, I am a mad scientist. I am going to examine the soil. I'm going to find out how it is structured and even more importantly, I will find out what is living under the soil. We'll tell you what's really going on down under there. But in real life, I am a mild mannered master gardener, Peggy Slyker. Today, we're going to uh, bring you information that is confirmed by real trusted scientists, not mad scientists, will bring you information that has been determined by research on soil structure, on the life that is found under the soil that actually does all the work for our gardens. We will tell you about making lasagna bed compost to improve your soil. And we will tell you how to keep your soil healthy and working for you in your garden. Thank you. Hi, so this class is not going to be about um, going out and buying soil. It's going to be about growing your own great soil, about how to bring a lot of life into your soil. This is not how you do that. You don't go to the yard and buy soil. Uh, you can, if you have to, you can start with this if you're doing raised beds, uh, but then you can also grow lots of life and good things into even this kind of soil. So let's start at the beginning. Um, what is soil? Soil is really um, just broken down, eroded, uh, from the parent rock. So you can see in this slide how we've got all these different layers and you can see all the rocky stuff down at the bottom. And then as we go up, the layers change. And we're gonna be talking about that top darker part, that the, the nice organic rich uh, soil that holds fertility and holds all the soil life and where your plant roots are. So that's the piece that we're gonna be talking about in here. So soil is made up of soil texture, uh, 
and that's a way to describe all the different sizes of the particles that soil is made up. Soil texture cannot be changed. Soil texture is what you have. So um, there's lots of ways that you can find out what your soil texture is. You can go on the internet and we'll have resources that will actually give you really simple tests to find out what your soil texture is. Um, and that's important because it can't be changed and you can learn how to manage what you have. But the gravel and sand are the large particles and then you have fine sand, you have silt, and then you have clay, which is the tiniest little particles. And the clay particles are actually kind of flat. All the other ones are more blocky shaped. Um, so again, soil texture can't be changed, but what can be changed and what we're going to be looking at is soil aggregates, the soil structure. So the soil, all the soil particles get aggregated together uh, through biological activity. And this uh, happens through plants, uh, roots, the plants um, exude kind of a glue in the, during their processes and also the uh, bacteria and fungi, they all are dropping out uh, organic matter that that aggregates the soil. So think granola as opposed to flour. So we want to go for granola. We don't want flour. So the soil aggregates are really important because it creates this pore space. And the pore space is what allows water to drain in, water to drain out, which then pulls in air and all the gases that we need. So, and it gives room for your plant roots to explore. So the pore spaces are super important. Uh, and that's what the aggregation does. Um, the microbial, as I said, microbial and fungal byproducts glue, they act like this glue that makes the particles, those fine uh, and not so fine particles all stick together. So that's a really important piece is to have that soil life that is going to produce this glue that is going to aggregate your soil. Now clay has kind of a bad rap um, because it doesn't drain and it does all this other weird stuff it's hard to work with, but clay is actually a really important and uh, helpful component of your soil because it's negatively charged. So it acts like a magnet and it holds all the positively charged uh, nutrients in our soils. So um, don't disparage if you have really clay soil, you can manage it and compost is the key. Adding lots of compost is gonna help bring lots of life, which is gonna help aggregate your soil into these larger bits where you can then have uh, good soil drainage. The other really important piece of soil, um, the soil science is uh, pH and the pH really affects the nutrient availability. So as you can see on this chart, at the top we have the range of pH. So it goes from four to 10. And what we're looking for is a neutral pH, and that would be seven is in the middle. So the four is the very acid, the 10 is the very alkaline. And you can see that all of our nutrients are listed here. And as the bands get wider, that shows that there's more availability in that pH. And you'll see that almost everything is the most available at a neutral pH. <clears throat> the one interesting, um, difference is iron. So you've probably heard about um, acid loving plants like azaleas and blueberries and those kind of things. Acid loving. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that they love acid. It means that they need iron for, their, to, for them to be healthy plants. So as you can see, the iron is more available when the soil is more acid, is lower pH. And that's why they're called acid loving. They're not actually acid loving, they're iron loving and they need their iron. So uh, the pH is an important piece of, of soils. 
Okay, so as Kristen was saying, we have the mineral particles, which are right here. And that would be, for example, the clay that is really a blessing and we should all be grateful because it's a great starting point. However, the mineral particles are locked. They are locked until you take the key up here, which is 5% of organic matter and add that. This unlocks the wealth as you can see represented by the gold coins of the mineral particles and brings everything to life. The air and water are also half of the components, but you don't have control over those. Although the organic matter, as Kristen said, it brings in these aggregates that improve the drainage. So next, Peggy will talk about the actual life contained in this 5% of organic matter that you're going to add with compost. And after that, we will talk about the three ways that you can bring compost into your garden. So far, we've been talking about the physical properties and the chemical properties of soil, um, which is half of our seminar material. The other half is who is living in that soil and how are they making our gardening work for us? Um, so we have here a slide that you might have seen before, you might have seen several times before because it's uh, apparently everyone's favorite summary of what's going on in that dirt. On the left hand side of your slide, you see the plants and the organic matter. This is the 5% organic matter that Mary was talking about and we've got your plants that you stuck in there as plant starts. Um, moving a little bit to the right, you've got the first, we'll call them the first level of uh, organisms in that soil. You've got bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. The bacteria and fungi are actually coming from the organic matter, uh, the, the compost that you put in there. And they are interacting with the soil by um, ingesting it and using its nutrients, changing the form of the nutrients to things that might have been not available to the plant, not bioavailable. As they digest some of these nutrients, they become a form that is available to the plant. Um, they have these nutrients in their bodies and also in their excretions. And then we moved a little bit more to the right and we have the next layer of uh, organisms that are going to eat the guys we just talked about. This is your food chain going on right here. So the next order, we have the larger organisms which eat the smaller ones and um, also excrete nutrients that the plant can use and use the nutrients with their own bodies. Moving farther to the right, we have um, nematodes and arthropods, and they eat the uh, smaller organisms, and they in turn are eaten by birds and animals. So we've got uh, what started out from the organic material that was the 5% in the soil. It's being transformed at every step of this way. Um, and even your animals, although they're not going to be consumed right at that point, they, ex they drop manure. They have bird droppings. All of these things have converted the nutrients of the soil into a form that is now available to the plants. Uh, we have here a um, list of how many, how many of these bacteria and fungi are available. We've got here, this is the teaspoon that you use in your kitchen. If you have just this much soil available, you have in that teaspoon, one billion bacteria, several yards of fungal filaments, several thousand protozoa, and scores of nematodes. So all of those organisms are there waiting in your soil to convert the soil nutrients into things that can be used by your plants. Um, 
there's way more information than we've had in just these two slides in this book, which is listed on our um, resource sheet that you can download. There's so much information in this book. If you're curious, that's where you should go. This is the slide that you've already seen that Kristen talked about. Um, it shows the dark areas around these pores are the organic matter. That's the 5% of organic matter that is added and unlocks all the nutrients. Um, you can see it clustered around. There's a sand grain there and the big holes, the pores are the area where the water and oxygen come through. So clustered around them is the organic material and a great portion of that organic material is actually our bacteria and fungi. Your plant, I think you've seen this slide also in Kristen's, your plant root tip is an area that is known as the rhizosphere and that's where all the action happens. That's where the um, actual exchange of minerals occur. Um, this is um, a bit like The pictures you see right here are on the one side a microscopic picture, those little filaments, the lines are the fungi coming through. And you can see on the lower right of your screen, that's the root tip. And you can see how the fungi come in. On the left hand side, we've backed off a bit and we show this uh, a larger field of action here. Uh, what's happening right here is that the um, root tip is bringing to the fungi some nutrients that uh, lure the fungi in. The fungi come bringing their converted soil nutrients as well as water, and we have an exchange going on there. The fungus gets carbon those organisms and the roots get the water and the nutrients and this uh, complex is called mycorrhiza so whenever you see that word you know they're talking about root tip and fungus uh, this to my mind is a lot like what's going on these days where we can't eat in restaurants um, this is just like your uh, takeout food being delivered to your door the fungi are the equivalent of that delivery guy and he brings you your food and um, you include a tip in your payment, and that's what the fungi gets in return for delivering the food. Um, right here we have, again, a review. Uh, the plants are releasing sugars into the root zone, and that's what is being used. That's the attraction for the bacteria and the fungi. Um, it's interesting to note that there are different... Um, in different areas, you have different proportions of the soil life organisms. In meadows, it's primarily bacterial, who are the organisms coming in and bringing in the nutrients and exchanging things. And in forests, it's primarily fungal. And these, um, among the fungi and among the bacteria, there are uh, unique combinations of these for different areas of the world, different areas possibly in your property. Um, and just, this is totally off topic, but there are now being discovered antibiotics that are produced by some of these soil living organisms. So not only are they helping out the plants that give you your food, in the long run, they can be helping our general health as well. Um, so here's just a quick summary. We've got the bacteria and fungi breaking down soil nutrients and retaining the nutrients within their bodies and in their excrement. And the protozoa come along and eat these bacteria and fungi, thereby releasing the nutrients in those organisms to be available to the plants. And as this process goes on, as we saw in an earlier slide, 
80% of the plant nitrogen can be supplied by this process. So we come to a summary of what's going on with um, the interaction between the soil life and your plant. Uh, the soil life itself provides disease protection for the plants by decomposing toxins that might be found in the soil. Uh, they release the nutrients in the soil by eating them and converting them. So that makes the nutrients available, both by the ones nutrients retained in their body and the nutrients that they excrete. And they also increase the water retention possibilities of the soil. These are the benefits related to the organisms and the structure of the soil also provides um, access to oxygen and it can increase the root length and health of the plant because of the structure, the open structure of the soil that you noted before. And here we have, uh, whenever there's a question relating to gardening, almost always the answer is compost. So here we have it again. The compost feeds the soil mi microorganisms that are within that 5% of organic matter and they bring about healthy soil. So whenever you're gardening, add compost. That's never a mistake. So there are three ways to bring soil life and organic matter into your garden. And the first way is composting. For learning how to do quality home composting, please look at the Nevada County Master Gardener website under compost is the gardener's best friend. And there you will see our complete slideshow with speaker's notes, as well as handouts and other resources. You can also click on the workshops and find our compost workshop that we did on Zoom. The second way to bring organic matter in your garden is through cover cropping, which Kristen is talking about now. Okay, I'm gonna talk about cover crop, which is to me one of the best ways of adding life into your soil. Uh, if you can keep something growing in your soil at all times, it is gonna aid the life, the soil life is just gonna be continuing. If you let your soil go fallow, um, then everything, all the life is going to slow down. And, and when you get planting again, then it has to kind of rev up. Whereas if you have uh, something growing all the time, then your soil life is just going to continue to build and continue to get stronger and more stable. So cover cropping is a great way of, of aiding your soil life uh, when your beds are would traditionally not be used, would just be let sit fallow, like through the winter. Uh, so cover cropping is just such a great uh, thing. Um, it increases organic matter. Um, it increases soil life, as I said, um, as we talked about earlier, how everything happens around the plant roots. The plant roots are what drive everything. Um, it adds nutrients. Um, it really improves the tilth, which is the workability of the soil, the, the, the aggregation, uh, the, all of those things that make a beautiful garden soil. Um, it aids in water retention because you're adding organic matter. Um, and it really aids beneficial insects because it will give um, many of them places to lay their eggs or to um, feed on the flowers. So it really helps the beneficials. It decreases weeds because it will actually outcompete weeds. You always wanna put it into a cleared area. You can't plant it in a place where weeds are already uh, have a foothold, but all soil has weed seeds, but the cover crop will outcompete the weeds. Um, it really aids in, um, it, it 
decreases compaction. It aids in opening up the soil. It helps prevent erosion and it helps decrease pests. They've actually been studies on certain cover crops like arugula has been shown to um, decrease root knot nematode, which is a real problem in tomatoes and the other solanaceae. So uh, arugula is a great thing to plant in between your um, crops of tomatoes. So uh, many cover crops in that same vein have these kind of, they're sort of specialized. They can do certain things like radishes, daikon radishes have these huge long roots and they really penetrate deeply into the soil and they bring nutrients to the surface and they open up compacted soils. And when you just leave the roots in place, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, instead of pulling out your plants, you leave, you cut them off at the soil level, leave the roots in place and they break down and leave all these great openings. Mustards do the same things. They have these long, very, um, penetrating roots that it's really good for breaking up hard pan and uh, new soils that are tight. And planting mustards can really help. Um, the legumes have this whole special thing going on with their roots. They have these nitrogen fixing nodules on their roots and you can see them in this slide. And there's a bacterium that actually takes atmospheric nitrogen, which is not plant available and it changes it in its bodies into a nit into a plant available form of nitrogen so it's really a great way to get free nitrogen so the legumes are a wonderful cover crop to be adding and it's great to do a mix of cover crops and right now we're kind of talking about the individuals um, there's cover crops, grasses that you can plant just for biomass, just to have a lot of organic matter in your soil. So this is a picture of some rye. You can use oats. There's lots of different things that you can use. Um, some cover crops are edible. So the daikon radishes, yum. Mustard greens, the young mustard greens are delicious. Uh, pea tips. Um, so you can actually graze and get some things for your salad and your dinner out of your cover crop beds. So there's winter and there's summer cover crops. Buckwheat is one of the great summer cover crops. Um, it's a great way to hold as a placeholder for your, your fall and winter vegetables. So it'll grow all summer. Actually, it has a really fast uh, seed to seed cycle about 42 days. So you can get multiple rounds of buckwheat. Um, and it actually has a way to bring up a form of phosphorus that is not plant available and within its cells, it turns it into a plant available form. So when the buckwheat is returned to the soil, you're actually adding phosphorus. And as um, you may know, our foothill soils tend to be really uh, lacking in phosphorus. So here's a, another great source of a free fertility just by planting cover crop. So here's just a photograph of, you know, using a mix of cover crops of different plants. So there's vetch and peas and clovers and oats, you know, and they all clamor together and they are all uh, doing a different service. Um, so it's a really complex and wonderful um, group of plants to have as a winter cover crop. And now's the time to be planting it. So now's the time. September is best um, through early November. Uh, you know, the cooler the soil gets, the slower your seeds are going to germinate, and then you have more chance of birds coming and eating your seeds or, you know, things. So it's, it's better to get them up and happy before the cool weather hits and the days get really short. And with summer cover crops, uh, like the buckwheat, you want to plant them after the last frost and the soils have warmed up. So maybe around when you would put your tomatoes in the ground are a good time to start to put your, the buckwheat in. Um, a lot of people say, well, how can I plant cover crop now? You know, my tomatoes are really cranking and, you know, I, how can I get 
rid of my tomatoes. Well, um, you can actually plant the cover crop around your existing plants. So this is uh, showing it with corn still standing, but you can do the same thing with your tomatoes or eggplants or any of your cool uh, warm season garden that's still producing and you don't want to take out yet. So you can just pop the seed in around there. So here's a short video on planting cover crop that may, you know, just give you some helpful tips. So once you're covered. Okay, we're just going to do a real quick demo on actually planting cover crop. So um, when you buy your seed, you can either get it pre-inoculated or um, not inoculated. If it's not inoculated, you want to buy the inoculant and follow the directions to inoculate your cover crop seed. So the way I do it is I just do this, you know, light sprinkle. You want to just make sure you have pretty good coverage. And then I just cover it with some kind of, we're going to use pine needles here. This stops the birds from eating it and it gives it some cover moisture, uh, cover to hold the moisture in. And then you would want to add your irrigation on top of this, or you can actually put your irrigation lines underneath this. It really doesn't matter because in the spring you're going to pull it away because you're going to have cover crop this tall. Um, so that's just getting it planted and then we're going to show you what it looks like three weeks later. So here is cover crop that was planted three weeks ago up. Um, Mary actually planted this in furrows along her irrigation lines, you can see. Um, so this is what it's going to end up coming up like. You can see she has guinea fowl and you can see that the guinea fowl have come in and they think whatever this grassy, it looks like maybe an oat, they think that's delicious. So this is a good reason why you want to protect it from the birds. So you can um, lay a floating row cover over it or shade cloth, which will protect it from the birds, protect the seedlings, so the birds, the wild birds don't take it. And it will come right up through the pine needles and straw or whatever you've used to um, put a mulch down. So it will come right up through there. So. so once your cover crop is up and growing and really happy, what about, what do you do with it now? So it's all about timing. So you wanna take your cover crop down. There's multiple ways that you can do that. Uh, you can use hand shears, you can weed whip it, you can use a hand scythe. Um, you, there's lots of different ways you can take it down. Electric head shears can work pretty well. I like to take it down from the top in sections. So take like six inches off, then another six inches and another six inches and another six inches. And um, the big thing about timing is you want to take it down right when it's just beginning to flower. Don't let it flower for very long because if you let it flower for too long, first of all, you're gonna start doing seeds and then the body of the cover crop is gonna get more woody. It's gonna take longer to break down. So you wanna take it down while it's still succulent. And that period of time is just as it's starting to flower. You can let it, you know, have a, like the peas have two or three flowers on them and then start and then take it down. Um, so really kind of pay attention to what's going on in the spring because it's going to take off fast after February. What I like to do is to sheet mulch my cover crop. And we're going to be talking uh, more in depth. Actually, we, we have a whole video on building a sheet mulched garden. But one of the ways that you can sheet mulch cover crop is to cut it down 
leave it in place in the garden, rake it up into the garden, into your bed, and then cover it with some compost and cover it with straw. And then just let it sit there for about five weeks. And then you just put your straw, pull your straw away and just plant right into it. And you'll have a beautiful uh, spring bed. If you need to seed, you'll probably want to um, add a layer of finely sifted compost to plant your seeds into because it'll be a little bit coarse, but it's great for planting starts into. And um, the lasagna gardening will have this uh, a video, a standalone video about lasagna gardening where we build a lasagna garden and you can watch how we do it and we'll explain the whole thing. And that's letting biology do your work for you. It's uh, the lazy gardener's way to great soil. So here's a fall lasagna bed that was built with the summer leftover summer plants. And that's what you'll see in the video too. You'll see that being built. And please watch that. Uh, this is an iconic slide. Uh, it's from a museum collection at the University of South Dakota that focuses on the Dust Bowl and the history of that time period. Um, but for our purposes today, we want to surround this with a big red circle with a slash through it saying, don't be like the Dust Bowl farmers. Um, we'll take it down now in scale and move to your backyard. These are techniques you can use that will keep your soil healthy and uh, preserve all the work that those soil organisms are doing for you. Uh, the first thing you want to establish whenever you put in a garden or when you expand your garden is to make permanent path areas and permanent bed areas. That's real easy if you're using raised beds. If you're using mounded uh, soil that you've been improving with lasagna gardening and cover cropping, you want to leave that mound in an area that you don't walk on. Walking obviously compresses the soil and will destroy the structure of the soil. So simply establish your paths and put mulch on them to keep your feet dry in the winter and plant in your uh, enriched soil. Um, there, you want to keep your soil covered because now that you've gone to all that work to make good soil, uh, why let the wind blow it away? You don't want it to wash down your paths and uh, disappear into streams or something like that during winter storms. So covered, they're illustrated here. On the left-hand side, you'll see a garden bed that's growing and there is mulch surrounding the plants. Any area that is not uh, covered by the plant, leaves and vegetation, uh, we cover with mulch. That also helps keep the soil moisture in during the growing season. On the top right, you've got the cover crops that Kristen was just talking about. You can see that these are raised beds that are going to be used in a different growing season. The paths are between them, covered with uh, mulch or straw, and the cover crops in the middle. On the bottom, on the right-hand side, is um, a bed, perhaps it's being formed right now by lasagna gardening. Perhaps it's just left as an area that you haven't put any cover crop in. It's also covered so that the soil won't be washed away in the winter or the seasons where you're not growing there. Um, in order to keep your soil life vibrant, there are a few things you should not do. Um, Avoid synthetic fertilizers. These are the water soluble, uh, often just one nutrient uh, combination uh, solutions that are available. They're essentially junk food for your plants because all of these nutrients are there, bang, in one big uh, bolus when you put the fertilizer on the plant. Um, this makes your plants lazy, they think. Why should I bother keeping those fungi around when they're gonna feed me all the stuff I want just like this? So not only does this uh, bolus of nutrient uh, hit the plant um, and then wash off into the waterways, but it also destroys the connection of your plant roots to 
the plant life that's there to help make life easier for you. It's also, a, often those are dangerous to use. The bottom uh, right slide is somebody tilling their garden bed. Now I'm speaking to you as a member of Tillers Anonymous. I used to do this and I thought it was so much fun. Um, but if you till season after season, you can see on the left hand picture here that your tilling blades go down only so far into the soil and below that area, immediately below that area, you get a pan of hard soil that uh, has been formed just below the area that you are tossing it to complete disarray. <clears throat> the tilling will destroy the structure of your soil. Um, that structure that is maintained by your plant life and your um, microorganisms in the soil. It turns all of that soil that uh, Kristen was referring to as granola sized particles, uh, it turns it all into flour. It completely disrupts and the organisms that were living there, having established their location and their neighbors and who they want to eat and who they want to be eaten by, all of this is totally disrupted. Whereas on the right hand side, if you're not tilling, you don't have this area of disrupted soil. You've got um, the structure with the air holes and all of the organic matter spread through it. And below that, you have a whole network of biopores and the roots can become much longer, go down, you have much more area for the still established soil microorganisms to contact the roots and carry out their functions. Uh, what you can do instead of tilling, when you have a bed that you've been using for a while or a bed that's maybe the second season or so of a lasagna bed that you're using now, um, the low till uh, weapons are your garden fork right here or if you wanna go top tier, you can get a broad fork. Both of these work the same way. You'll put uh, compost or any kind of organic uh, nutrient additives that in case your soil is deficient and you want to add some nutrients, uh, you can sprinkle that along with the compost on the soil. You step on the broad fork and lift the soil up. Um, that'll allow your additives to dribble down into the holes that it just made. Then you pull your fork back up, everything falls back into place and all of your soil organisms are still happily living in their established neighborhoods. Um, here is a reminder that when you've got your cover crop going, just leave it there and it will continue to improve your soil. Okay, this is a chart we designed to be a resource for you to figure out when and how and which method to use for building your soil. It compares all three and you can download this chart from the Master Gardener website. So hot composting, for example, is more work up front, less work later. You just let it sit for six months and then all you have to do is move it to top dress your beds. The lasagna bed gardening is less material that you have to move, so it's less work up front, and it's absolutely no work later. You plant directly into it. The cover crop is great when you don't have any materials. You grow your own materials, and then you broadcast seed that you have to buy. It's very little work later on when you chop it down to let it compost in place. Then you can also combine, in this section it shows how you can combine the methods so please download the chart and all of our other resources by looking at the Master Gardener, Nevada County Master Gardener website and have fun improving and building your beautiful living soil. So one of our participants, Terry, asked if um, 
I'll just quote, I get confused when I go into nurseries and they want me to fertilize. They say the organic ones are good. I wanna be more natural. So where are the better sources? Are organic ones okay? These are the quote, more natural nurseries. So, or so I thought. I can take that, um, I'm Kristen here. Um, the organic fertilizers are gonna be more slow release. And the thing about organic fertilizers versus synthetic fertilizers is that they feed the soil. The organic fertilizers feed the soil and then the soil feeds your plants where the synthetic fertilizers actually damage the soil life, but they feed the plants. So you get quick results on your plants, but you often get um, fast rank growth that is more um, susceptible to insect attack. It's much better to have really robust, healthy soil life that you feed with organic fertilizers and compost and other organic matter that then feeds your plants and your plants will be healthier. One other thing that one of our people asked about was that they have access to manure, but what would be the best approach to actually using it to achieve what we're trying to achieve? Well, I can take that again, um, Kristen again. Um, so with the manure, you can either compost it directly, depending on how much you have access to. If you have access to a lot, you can build a large compost pile with it and then add it to your garden. You can um, watch our lasagna garden presentation and there we use manure and building a lasagna garden. So it's basically composting in place. Another word is sheet composting. Um, you don't necessarily wanna use raw manure in a garden that you're gonna plant directly into. So you wanna wait a little while, you wanna compost it in some fashion, either in a, in a hot pile, a cold pile, or sheet compost it, but it's a wonderful resource. Perfect, perfect. I think that's about it for our questions, the references, and then really the importance of feeding organically. And thanks, you, I always learn something and I love being with our seasoned master gardeners and you three certainly exemplify that. Thank you everyone.